Uh, Vincent, uh, friends, I'm going to tell you nothing at all about technology and wonders, uh, except to say that I am excited about the new BAUS, as I call it, the new format, the shortened format of the BAUS meeting. As part of it, you can come and ask me anything that you want tomorrow afternoon at the BAUS booth, which is 4.45, uh, four this is at 12.30. Lunch is provided, uh, but no drunkenness, please, in the afternoon. You can ask me anything that you want. The best of UK, these are the best papers that the BJUI has published over the last year, and we have had no difficulty in selecting them and putting them in a virtual issue for your reading pleasure and I encourage you to go on to the BJUI website, which is www.bjui.org, and click on the virtual issues. I can guarantee that you will not be disappointed. The person to tell you about all the technology is here in front of us. Caroline Moore has been researching focal therapy for prostate cancer, would you believe it, for 15 plus years. She reminded me this morning that over that period of time, one of her children has become 18 and is making various demands at home as an 18-year-old. This comes from an established group within UCL who have not just introduced new technologies, but also evaluated them in the manner they should be. Here to receive the John Blandy Prize, I give you Caroline Moore. Caroline, come on up. So I'd like to thank you very much indeed for this, uh, this huge honour of giving the Blandy Prize lecture this year. Many of you will have heard of Professor John Blandy. Not all of you will have heard him. And um, I was particularly really inspired by his ability to innovate and his breadth of practice, which is... Uh, found in very few people these days. He, um, he did an interview with Dominic Hodgson, who I see here in the audience, and I have a little clip from that, talking about the difficulty of innovation. took me on one side and said, you know, John, I want you to give up this silly TUI. You'll bring St. Peter's into disrepute. Right. <laughs> Who is this? I'm not going to tell you. Right. Okay. <laughs> and I was particularly pleased to hear that, that clip because I did have a moment at the end of my first period of research on this work where I was taken aside by an elder and better and told that I was... Um, a good sort of a person, I should give up these foolish studies and move on to some proper urology. So uh, I kind of took that advice and did some proper urology and kind of carried on with, uh, with the work. So this is the paper that I'll, I'll talk to you about today, but I'm actually going to set it in the context of the, of the journey. As Procar mentioned, it's been quite a long journey. So this uh, summarises the journey. I started as a research fellow on this work in 2002. Our first patient was treated in 2004, although I did have a period of uh, maternity leave in between there. And you may have heard the work presented at the EAU last year, the first RCT in focal therapy. And there was a lot of news coverage when the formal paper of that was published just before Christmas. And I'm going to take you through some of the steps of that journey. It wasn't the only journey to be going on at the same time. 
when I started. The first Harry Potter film had just come out. And he progressed, and there's now a post-Harry Potter world to think about. And as Prokhar has also mentioned, when I started, my oldest daughter was two years old. Uh, she's doing her last A-level this morning. She'll be 18 uh, next month, and she's now got three siblings as well. So lots of journeys go on at the same time. This was actually the first paper I had published in the BJUI back in 2005. And this was really asking the question, could photodynamic therapy be a treatment for the future? You can see from the schematic here that you have a patient to whom you give a drug which makes the patient sensitive to light. Sensitive to light of a very specific wavelength and the most efficient way to give that light is with a laser fiber because you can get single wavelength light. Naturally, it's a little difficult to get light into the prostate and I shall talk to you about that. And then this sets off a reaction with the photosensitizer and the oxygen in the tissue to give you uh, singlet oxygen, hydroxyl radicals and superoxide radicals that cause the tissue damage around the light fiber. When I started, I had to do a, a systematic review. It took me an afternoon because there was one letter and one paper published. It's very rare to be in a position to do such a short systematic review. We had some conference presentations and we put these into the review. But this was the entirety of the literature at the time um, of the paper. And really what we were looking at here was the, the, the gap in translation. There's a lot of work on photodynamic therapy in cells, in animals, but not a lot in the clinical world. And starting those early phase clinical trials is really a privilege to have been part of that, uh, that journey. So you can imagine that with a, a drug, a um, the journey from lab to phase three trial is, is a long journey. When you take into account the fact that you need not only the drug, you need the laser and all the um, regulations about devices that you have there, and you need skilled personnel who will be able to perform the procedure. You have patient variability, which can be quite marked. And in this, we were also looking, as well as developing a complex intervention, we were looking at really a new concept, which was focal therapy for prostate cancer, where we aim to kill the cancer, the whole cancer, and nothing but the cancer. So this was some um, photos from those early days, myself and Claire Allen, uroradiologist, who many of you will know well. So the procedure is carried out a little bit like um, high dose rate brachytherapy, you can see the needle, um, the hollow plastic needles that go into the prostate there. These were positioned under ultrasound guidance according to a pre-prepared plan. There's then an infusion of the drug that took 20 minutes, a drug light interval of just under 11 minutes, and then 20 minutes of giving the laser light when all the other lights were, were turned off. The, in terms of the diffusers that we use, they're cylindrical diffusers which are essentially like strip lights. So you can choose the active length, and we um, had a great time sourcing the appropriate um, diffuser fibres, because even these weren't um, standard kit at the time. And we measured very carefully, because we were very keen to assess how effective the treatment was, and with the variables of the drug dose, the light dose, um, the oxygen, and then the patient, we really needed to understand what caused variability. So we made a lot of measurements of exactly where we put our fibers. So in order to prepare for the first patient in the untreated prostate, it was quite an intimidating challenge. Some of you may remember the Northwick Park uh, disaster of giving a drug to six healthy volunteers. This happened just a few weeks before we were due to have our first patient wasn't uh, quite as scary as it might have been because my colleagues in Canada had used the drug, but they'd used it in the post-radiotherapy prostate. And we all know that post-radiotherapy, the vascularity of the prostate is very different. And as this is a vascular acting drug, we were uh, very concerned to make sure that first we did no harm before we could really assess the efficacy. So I went to, I went to Canada to see them perform one procedure. We also thought carefully about light penetration in the prostate. 
This um, isn't a topic that many people have thought very much about. Uh, there have been some animal studies, and you can imagine it's a difficult one to study. Who on earth would agree to have light sources and light sensors put into the prostate for extended studies, taking measurements in a very tedious manner from the patient's point of view? Well, at UCLH, we have a high-dose rate brachytherapy program, and at the time, men had their needles put in for this under a general anaesthetic, and they kept them in for 36 hours. So I said, I wonder if you would mind, while you're doing nothing between your radiotherapy doses, I simply put in a few fibres, make a few measurements. It'll only take about an hour and a half. They were very um, kind to let me do this, and it was very helpful to the work. So this allowed us to do, to do these measurements, looking at how far this particular wavelength of light would go in the prostate. You can see four typical patients um, from that work. Each circle is a light fibre, and the radius of the circle is the penetration depth of that, that wavelength of light. And as you can see, it really does vary markedly, which was quite a worry, because there was no way of knowing in any individual patient what this would be. However, you do at some point have to start with the clinical work because you won't know how it's going to be until you do that first patient. We wanted to start safely, of course, so we used just one light fibre. And the patient knew that this was going to be unlikely to help him. We went ahead with the treatment and it went very safely. There were no adverse events, um, but not a lot of effect. Patient number two had a superficial venous thrombosis. Again, these were different times. He lived in the, he was the landlord of the local pub, and so I did a home visit to him. His, his daughter was a nurse. She called me to say there was a problem, so I popped around and had a look. He was fine. Patient number three, we decided we'd modify the procedure and do a saline infusion after the drug infusion. After that, we had no further problems with um, local thrombosis. Patient number four was an interesting one. There was a lot of um, preparation on the day of each of these treatments. Um, some people from the company would come, there would be various monitors, and um, a lot of arrangements had been made. Patient number four, I found on my pre-op examination on the morning of the procedure that he'd already got a deep venous thrombosis that hadn't been detected previously. So he was cancelled, and we were glad to have avoided that as a serious adverse event. So the work that I did in my first period as a research fellow um, was with this drug WST09. We treated 34 men, but we had two serious adverse events. One was cardiac ischemia, requiring an emergency coronary stent, and one was a pulmonary embolus. And you can imagine, at the start of this journey, here's a drug that hasn't been used in men who are on the border of needing treatment or not, so that we can try it safely, and we've caused two significant events. Looking at all of the data, we felt that it was most likely to be due to the vehicle that we were using to, to deliver the drug. And so we went back to our colleagues in Israel and asked them to develop a water-soluble version of the drug, which they did, but naturally this took a little time. So during this time, we'd widened our group of investigators, so we still had John Trachtenberg in Canada with us um, working, and we had another six units throughout uh, Europe. Many of these are still involved in the work. So when we had this new drug formulation, we realised that we knew that we needed to escalate the drug dose. We needed to look at how to escalate the light dose. We needed to have a safe, iterative approach, which essentially meant that we would consent him out to the study, treat him, await the one-week MRI scan, and then consent the next man, telling him exactly what had happened to each of the men who'd gone before him. Doing this in a single centre, as I did in my first study, was fairly straightforward because I knew, I knew everybody very well, I knew all the patients very well, and in fact I'm still in touch with some of them. Doing it in a multi-centre European and Canadian setting made it more challenging. There was also the question of treatment planning. When we did our first study, we would plan the treatment on the day. We usually had a urologist and a radiologist in theatre, and we would decide on our, our treatment plan. 
when we were doing this at arm's length with nine different centres, we had to provide a written treatment plan for each of the centres. So this is the new formulation of the drug, and this is the group of patients that were reported in the, in the paper that was awarded the prize. So again, we had to start out small. We knew that there was variability. We also started out very safely in a man who had basically no clinically significant disease, but was willing to take part in order for us to see whether this was safe or not. You can see his one-week MRI just there. And that little bit is the treatment effect, absolutely tiny, but no adverse effects. The next patient had three, three treatment fibres and very small treatment effect. Again, nothing that you would deem of significance, but no adverse events. For the next man, we took a, a significant step up, still at the same drug dose, but markedly more fibres. And finally, you can start to see something. So this is the one-week post-gadolinium um, MRI scan, and you can see the lack of uptake here, 12 mils of lack of uptake, and um, the sort of effect that we were looking for, and it was nicely contained in the prostate with no um, extra prostatic events. It was therefore deemed that we could go to our drug dose escalation, However, that meant dropping the fibres down again. And you can imagine each one of these things takes three weeks to get the patient ready, treat a patient, have the MRI, redo the consent process and, and begin again. So one fibre, not very much effect, and this is at the six milligram per kilogram drug dose. Still at the six and with three fibres, really quite an extensive effect there which we felt was probably a little bit too much for many of the um, smaller prostates in particular. So we therefore settled, after completing the study, on the drug dose of 4 milligrams per kilogram and 200 joules per centimetre for the light dose. We knew that in terms of how many fibres we put together, we developed a metric called the light dose intensity, which was the number of fibres per mil of tissue, and this needed to be greater than one. And so the story continued. The next um, aspect was looking at those particular metrics that we'd determined to be the optimal to see how often we could get a good result in a multi-centre setting. This again was published in the BJUI. This was a study of 85 men across a number of uh, European centres. Again, it proved to be safe, and the negative biopsy rates in those who'd had the optimal treatment were 82%, which again was felt to be very acceptable. This was done with very little in the way of urinary and sexual function toxicity, a little bit of um, reduction in the IIAF, um, but not a lot. So then we had to question ourselves, how should we prepare for a multi sentiment randomized control trial. We had a lot of debate about whether we should be randomizing people to radical prostatectomy for this treatment, or whether we should be randomizing people to active surveillance for this treatment. And because of the safety profile of it, we decided that we would rather randomize men to active surveillance, uh, assess the difference between the two arms, and that did leave people with the option to have another treatment later on. We continued with our central treatment planning and developed some software to help with that. We had our one-week MRIs from all over the world assessed by our group at UCLH so that we could plan the next treatment. And there were a number of interesting issues. There were a couple of centres that didn't comply with the protocol and had to be closed, and there was no access to the drug outside of the studies, which I think is really important when you're trying to uh, develop a, a programme like this. We ran training programs, so this was uh, Professor Azuzi from France, he was our first trained operator in this. And as I said, we had a lot of debate about the exact protocol, and that was really influenced by the fact that clinical practice across the countries was different. And there were 42 centres in this study. You may well have seen it, it was published in Lancet Oncology in December, and it was presented, as I said, at the EAU before that. 499 men were screened and 413 men were randomised 
to active surveillance or photodynamic therapy. And the results can be seen. So they, the progression-free survival was reported, and this was much higher in men who'd had a treatment than men on active surveillance, as you might expect. You can see the figures just there. In terms of the change from baseline, there was very little effect on the, both the sexual function and IPSS. And this was widely reported. It was, as you can see, went across uh, many news outlets and has resulted in many people asking urologists all over the place for this uh, magical seaweed treatment. So really, I just wanted to um, thank you again for this, this prize and recognition of the work. And to reiterate what a long journey it is. It's been 15 years so far, and that was starting with a drug that had been used. It's involved many collaborations with patients, scientists, clinicians, and industry. It's been an iterative process that um, would have been difficult to speed up in some ways because of the need to do it safely. And the challenges continue. The drug is not yet approved. It's um, at the European Medicines Agency, and we're awaiting their outcome. And there may be newer things that will be better in due course. So it may be that 15 years plus of work is overtaken by the new thing quite soon. We shall see. I have the support of our fantastic team at UCL and UCLH and all our collaborators there as well as internationally. I'm very happy to have any questions. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting. I did do one of the television interviews at that time as well, and I said focal therapy is a, is a logical step. There are a number of modalities. It's interesting and promising, and interestingly, it didn't get aired because it wasn't quite dramatic enough. Um, some patients are clearly not suitable, and it's easy to tell them that. Oligometastatic disease, advanced disease, um, very straightforward. Um, we had a lot of patients come to us as well, and some of them, and so we, our standard thing was to tell them that they, if they had localised disease, Gleason 7 or less, they could be assessed for suitability for focal therapy. We have a focal therapy programme at UCLH um, using other modalities, um, a lot of HIFU, but some other treatments too. And so for the suitable men, we would invite them to clinic and have a discussion. We'd need a high-quality MRI with contrast would need their biopsy results from the local centre. And that was really enough to start the discussion. And the discussion really consists of, here's a modality in terms of any of the focal therapies where the side effect profile is less than radical treatment. And it is so because you're treating a smaller volume of tissue. So it's not surprising. Of course, there is a balance to that. And the balance is that the need for a second treatment is higher than with radical treatments. So one in four men with focal therapy will need a second treatment by five years. One in 20 needs surgery or radiotherapy. To some men, those five years without radical treatment are really important, same as for, for men on surveillance. Other men would rather have a bigger procedure first time. And so once you've had that discussion, you can see whether somebody is still keen to explore the option of focal therapy then you can further assess whether they need more biopsies or not, and then which part of the focal therapy program they might fit into. And it essentially boils down to peripheral zone tumours tend to get HIFU, the transrectal um, delivery, and anterior tumours tend to get a needle-based treatment. And these is, this is one of the needle-based treatments that 
I hope will be available in the future. Yeah, so the wavelength for this is 763 nanometers, and it's very specific to the drug. It's a, it's a non-thermal effect. Um, somebody did try it at 753, didn't seem to work quite so well, and the lab work, the cell work, the animal work would all suggest that 763 is your optimal, optimal wavelength for, for this particular drug. There'll be, there are other drugs that we can use for photodynamic therapy. They tend to be anything between sort of 650 and 800 nanometers. Caroline, do you, do you think we'll ever see a trial of focal therapy versus either radical prostatectomy or external beam radiotherapy in low to intermediate response? So, um, the, 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 so the PART trial, exactly does that, partial or radical treatment. Um, it's run successfully for its um, pilot study um, of 80 patients. We've been a center for that, but we've actually not recruited to it ourselves, mostly because we get many patients who've already rejected radical treatment elsewhere and come to us for focal therapy. I think there's always going to be challenges of equipoise amongst patients and surgeons, but the, the part study has certainly finished its pilot phase and they're looking for funding for the bigger phase. So I would you know, very much support that study even though we weren't able to recruit to it from our, from our centre. Simone Jonah from King's College of I have a question about side effects. I see that many of the area treated were quite close to the prostatic urethra. Mm -hmm. Did you have any urethral necrosis? Yeah, so quite interestingly, on, in terms of the MRI findings, you would notice urethral necrosis. Um, it was a little bit dependent on the drug and light dose in the post-radiotherapy patients. They noticed a lot of urethral sparing, but I don't think we really saw that. But in terms of symptoms, if you're treating half the prostate or less, it would rarely give rise to any troublesome symptoms. There were, in the earlier treatments where we did uh, treatment around the urethra, you would, um, there were a couple of strictures, but when you're treating focally, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Thank you. I think that's all our questions, so thank you very much.